Ah, uh, there we go. Hey, you're live. Hi. Hello, everybody. Later, Welcome to our... We're all set with a year in the live Gamba Quail, and our speaker is Doris Evans. Uh, I hope you would be mute phones and turn off your video, slash mark your video, and um, Doris will do a little introduction uh, of herself. She did serve um, quite a bit of time as curator of education at the Arizona and Sonoran Desert Museum. And she lives in Tucson. Um, the footage for today's presentation was taken. Uh, and Doris, would you like to add to that, please? Well, I'm a retired teacher. I taught uh, for, mainly fourth grade and a few others too for about half of my career. And the other half was uh, pretty much in, uh, involved with environmental education at the Desert Museum. My last job was with the Tucson Unified School District as the uh, resource teacher for environmental education. Great. Uh, now, now retired. <laughs> Yeah, so you, you bring a lot of expertise and information about photography and, and bird photography in particular uh, in your presentation. So let's get on with that. We're very interested in hearing okay. how you did it and what you did. Okay, thank you. Well, you know, not all birds are loved. Some people are aghast at a, a the sight of a hawk ripping apart a dove or a roadrunner bashing a uh, lizard to death on a rock. Others might think uh, vultures are ugly and disgusting. And some people may fear the hooting of an owl in the dark of night. But have you ever heard of anyone who does not like our quail? And what's not to like? Those cute round plump bodies waddling along, the wonderful design on the face of the male, the uh, amusing squawks and whoop, whoop, whoops and cluck, cluck, cluck sounds as they communicate amongst themselves. The darling fuzzy little chicks and the wonderful family commitment they, they have and that endearing top knot of feathers. So let's take uh, an intimate look as we go on the journey of our gambled quail throughout the year. But first, a little bit about photography. You'll be the camera club. Uh, you may, you'll want to know what I use. And so I thought I'd take care of that right now. Uh, most of the videos that you will see are done with either this, my GoPro or my little Polaroid cube camera. Now these are not motion activated. You press the button, set it down where you hope you're going to get something interesting and you walk away. And about an hour later, by the time the battery runs down, you go pick it up and check it out and see what you have. You might have an hour's worth of dirt, or you might have some really interesting footage. Uh, most of the other pictures were taken with my Canon uh, EOS 7D with a zoom. And some were taken with my little Canon PowerShot. And there were, there's one that is for, taken with my trail camera and another one with, uh, with a uh, iPhone. A little bit about the quail. Uh, they're about 10 inches in length from bill to the, before the tail starts. They're common throughout the Sonoran Desert, but they do occur in the Mojave and Chihuahuan deserts. It's the only gallinaceous bird native to the Sonoran Desert. Now gallinaceous birds are those heavy bodied ground feeders like the quail and pheasant and grouse and ptarmigan and the like. The gambles quail are in flocks most of the year, but during nesting season, they pair up. Their diet is mostly uh, plant material, though they're known to eat insects. And they have an amazing variety of calls, grunts, cackles, clucks, caca, caca, chip, 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 squawk, whoop, 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 and more. And they recorded 10 different calls. Uh, some, most, of, uh, most of them are by male and female, but are a few exclusive male or female. And the Gamble's quail is named after William Gamble, a naturalist with the Academy of Sciences in Philadelphia, who was on a field trip in 1841 and was the first one to report the species. Okay, how do we tell the guys from the girls? Well, with quail, it's easy. Uh, here are some views of the male. 
Uh, they have a uh, cinnamon crown, black around the face, all neatly bordered in white, a nice top knot that's made up of about six feathers, and a cream colored abdomen with uh, a big black splotch in the middle. And I like the guy in the lower uh, middle, looks like he's doing a schmoo imitation for those of you who remember a little Abner schmooze. And interestingly, as I was going through my photos for this program, I discovered I had loads of photos of the male, but not many of the female. And I thought, well, that's weird. Then I kind of figured out, well, the males are very photogenic and the females are not as easily seen. The males, especially this time of year, will get up on a high perch somewhere and they're much more easily photographed. Now the females lack the facial pattern. They do have that top knot, but it's thinner and shorter. And they have the uh, cream abdomen, but they lack the black splotch. So I uh, put together uh, my female pictures and I added a little music to make it interesting. The quail sisters meet every morning in the desert. They all wear question marks upon their heads. They gather in circles and talk of seeds and blossoms. Sometimes I hear them from my bed. As they dance through every rumor, as chicks are being fed, they scratch on every topic, and though it's all been said, the quail sisters meet every morning in the desert, and they all wear question marks upon their head. They gather in circles and talk of seeds and blossoms, sometimes I hear them from my bed. As they dance through every rumor, as chicks are being fed, they scratch on every topic, and though it's all been said, the quail sisters meet every morning in the desert, and they all wear question marks upon their heads. Yes, the quail sisters meet every morning in the desert. Okay, spring comes to the desert. And now we are seeing the quail up in the trees. You may think, oh, that's really weird. Why aren't they on the ground? What are they doing up there? Well, what's happening is, uh, especially the mesquite and the Palo Verde, all these fresh little leaves and flower buds are coming out. And the quail get up there and they munch on all that fresh green growth. And that is providing them with the vitamins they need to get those reproductive systems going. They're kind of fun to watch a quail walk up and down the branch of a tree. Here's a Palo Verde. And now is the time you really will notice the males. They get up on a high perch. It could be the top of a saguaro skeleton up in a branch, maybe in the roof of a house. And they're making this call, throwing their head back. And they're announcing perhaps their territory or what a good looking quail they are. And uh, here's how it sounds. And only the male makes this call. Also this time of year, you might see some tussles among, tussles among the males. And they'll do this other times of the year too, but especially during breeding time. They will really get after each other. Perhaps uh, they're showing hair, one quail is showing hierarchy, perhaps doesn't like the other guy being in his territory, who knows but I uh, slowed this down. I really had my little camera out to catch some feeding on them, some seeds I tossed, 
but I got this, which was quite a, a nice surprise. And I slowed down the action to make it easier to see what's going on. However, that also slows down the video, I mean, the audio. So it sounds like a Three Stooges movie. <laughs> When the females are walking around as if nothing's happening. Okay, it's nesting time. The female apparently selects the nest type, and it's almost always on the ground, but oftentimes in a flower pot, and I bet you've had that experience. And it's usually about 10 or 12 eggs laid over a period of a few days. Now, the mom quail can't lay all of the, uh, 12 eggs at the same time. Uh, so Four to six eggs are laid in a 24 hour period. Then there's a day of rest. And then three cycles later, all the eggs are laid. However, there can be 20 or more eggs in the nest. And this is usually the result of egg dumping by another female. I'll talk about that in a moment. The female does most of the incubating, but the male is nearby. And uh, somebody was telling me about an experience they had where the female just disappeared and the male did all of the incubating. But incubate, uh, the incubation begins when the last egg is laid, not before. So that way the chicks all hatch at the same time. And it's approximately 21 days of sitting on the eggs, usually April and May. And the eggs, as you will see soon, hatch within minutes of one another. And the male and female, uh, the female and the chicks leave the nest immediately, leaving the shells behind. And the male is always right nearby. And the chicks are precocious, and that means they're ready to run as soon as they hatch. And they stay with the parents for about three months. One, my first experience with a uh, nest in a flower pot was on my front porch. There were six eggs neatly laid. And I wouldn't even have known that the eggs were there because when mom was sitting on them, they were just, she was so camouflaged. <laughs> and the only reason I knew about it is she flew up in a flurry as I walked by too close. And so I kept my eye hoping and hoping that I would see the eggs hatch. And sure enough, one day I luckily looked out and they were just hatching, just coming out of the eggs, all six hatched. And that was a rather tall flower pot. So I was concerned, uh, how are they gonna get out of that flower pot? Maybe I'd have to help them. But one by one, they jumped off the rim about two feet fall, uh, fall, landed on their little feet and followed mom. Here's mom with the chicks and dad was right nearby on the branch of a mesquite tree, just calling and calling. They ducked under the gate on my front porch, jumped down the steps and off the desert to the desert they went. Another experience was really quite interesting. This is back just a few years ago and we were putting in a brick driveway over the dirt. And, uh, oh, it was noisy. The, the uh, machinery was going, they were tamping down the dirt, they were sawing blocks, music was blaring from their radio. And I wandered out just to see how things were going and to say hi. And one of the workers pointed right next to the driveway and said, Coronis, Coronis. And I knew that was quail, there what? So I looked and here is mom quail sitting on eggs within just a few feet of the driveway next to a dead bursage, no shade. So look what the workers did. They made this little shelter of driveway bricks around her. And there were 15 eggs. So maybe there was some egg dumping going on here. And it was getting hot. It was June and it was getting to hundred plus. So I went into my garage and I foraged around and I found uh, some styrofoam. I mean, school keepers, uh, school teachers keep stuff because you never know when you might use it. And so I found these pieces and I made a little insulation for her. 
I kept checking and the eggs all hatched. And I was concerned because there was really not much uh, shelter except for the little bricks. And snakes, especially uh, coach whips and king snakes are great devourers of quail eggs as are Gila monsters. And I have lots of those in my neighborhood. And then anything else that might eat an egg, a herbill thrasher or anything could come in and uh, take, have a great feast here. But they all had, uh, almost all hatched, a few did not. And so that was a successful nest. I picked up the eggs because uh, they're no longer any use and the birds never come back to the nest. And this is the nest, a few sticks in a circle and a few feathers. But my most exciting experience happened exactly a year ago. My next door neighbors, I might mention where I live. I live off of Silver Bell uh, Road in the Tucson Mountains off of El Camino del Cerro. My next door neighbors were out on an East, early Easter morning and they were looking for places to hide their granddaughter's Easter eggs. And while they walked around, they discovered this nest. What a perfect place. It, they had a big rock out there, decorative rock. And the eggs were in this little niche in the rock with a young saguaro nearby and other vegetation. And there are the eggs and there are 20 of them. And this is probably the result of it has to be the result of egg dumping, but that's an official term. And it means that while this one mom is laying her eggs, another mom quail comes by and for some reason has abandoned her nest. Maybe some predator had gotten in, who knows the reason. And she comes by and she plops down on this nest and lays her eggs as well. So there were 20 eggs. And oh, I was so excited. So I thought, what an opportunity this is going to be. So I took each morning I would go out with one of my little cube cameras, set it down next to the nest and she would run off for just a few moments and come right back. And I'm just showing a few of my many, many videos. That was quite a project to keep 20 eggs beneath one bird. So she would push one in and another one would pop out very patient quail. Fluffs herself out, wiggles herself around, apparently trying to get all the eggs underneath and maybe turning them a bit too. I'm not sure about that. Something that has her interest. Oh, there was a feather out of place. And we'll just toss it back in. Nice thing about these little cameras, these cube cameras, you can just walk away and so you're not bothering the bird at all. And then another day, I was kind of curious, usually she would just run right in and plop down on the eggs, but this day she was very cautious. And for the first time, I see dad come in. So I'd love to know what's going on. Are they checking in on the eggs? The future kids? You testing out what it's like to sit on eggs? I guess he decides, nah, that's no fun. And mom quickly comes in. Oh, 
Well, I was getting concerned. I counted the days from when these eggs were first noticed and we were approaching 21 days. Then it was 22 days and I thought, oh, they're never gonna hatch. But she was still sitting on them. So I patiently, every day, every morning, I got to know their backyard very well. Every morning I would go in with my cam, one of my little cube cameras, let it go for about an hour, go back and exchange it for another one. And I thought, oh, I hope something happens here. And one day I went over to look and the eggs were moving. And the hatching had begun. And this whole uh, event took about a half hour between the time I noticed the hatching and the time they were gone. But of course, I edited out a lot of the time. So here's a, a look at our baby quail. Really wet when they first come out of the egg, but they dry up very quickly and fluff out. They pip around the, the top of the egg and they start their peeping when they're still in the egg. And mom and dad were just on the other side of that rock and they were calling. Like the upside down guy with his feet up in the air. He turns over. Soon all the eggs, all but one egg hatch. And mom and dad are calling and kids apparently hear them. And then I slow motion this down to look at the effort it must take for those little chicks to walk a ways to, to get to the family. And they all took off about the same time. This is slow motion. And there are the eggs, all but one hatched. And you'll notice the blotches. Well, when the egg is still inside the mother, they're white. But as the, and this is true of other birds too, not just quail. And as the egg goes, passes down the oviduct, there are glands on the sides of the oviduct that contain pigment. And as the egg passes down, these little splotches are made like a paintbrush along um, the eggshell. And you'll notice there are no two alike. Some have more uh, spots, some have fewer. One egg almost looks white. And uh, it's probably because uh, the, you know, there are three times that uh, Mrs. Quail lays her eggs. And it might be that that was the last egg that session to go down the oviduct and maybe the little glands ran out of paint. Some birds don't have any pigment at all. Uh, one that comes to mind is the woodpecker. 
when you have eggs down deep in a cavity, you don't need to color them to camouflage them. But the quail have this nice camouflage. And if you haven't seen a quail egg, I put a quarter there to show the size. And there are the chicks all covered with down, all fluffy, big feet. And uh, that down lasts about a week or so. And during that time, they can't thermoregulate themselves well. So if it gets too cool or too warm, they dash to mom or dad and get underneath their feathers and they fluff out and they are protect the chicks or for danger as well. And you can't see a chick anywhere. They're all underneath mom or dad. But notice now it's a pattern on the feathers. They've lost that down and they're getting their first molt. And little bitty top knots are showing. Look at the feet. A little more top knot. And the quail right away are feeding themselves. They probably a lot of an instinct and maybe watching mom and dad. And what I did here is I just threw out, I don't feed a lot. I don't feed anything but birds. And I only throw out a, a few seeds and I toss them out here. This is next to my yard, just to see uh, the quail feeding. And here we are. They learn quickly to pick up the dirt and check underneath to see if they pick up some seeds or a very tasty cover. Sometimes when one of the parents kicks, kicks them right through it to see what mom and dad can come from. Amazingly, my little cute camera survived the By the way, the bird in the background is a white-winged dove. We only come in in summer. I saw my first one a couple of days ago. They migrate to isn't long before the parents introduce the kids to my water dish. This is in my front yard. Now this dish is not as deep as it looks. It has a very, very uh, thick bottom. And I put during baby quail time, I put some flat rocks. You can see the one in the foreground. I put flat rocks in the bottom and the chicks you can see are standing on them. And I've never ever uh, seen a dead or drowned baby quail. Those little wings actually work pretty well right off the bat. We have some kids learning to drink. Reaching way down, and I try to keep the water level a little lower as well. As I mentioned earlier, you never know what you're going to get when you set down one of these little cameras and just turn it on and walk away. And my uh, plan at this time was to get a, a video of that cottontail rabbit you see doing a dust bath. I'll talk more about dust baths in a bit. And uh, it didn't perform at this time, but I got something else instead. Here comes a new quail family. While dad is checking out this little depression that Cottonwood had made, the kids wait patiently. He dads through there and they obediently follow. <laughs> and 
the rabbit and the squirrel. Like, okay, the dust bath is mine now. Just a little portrait of a chick, probably about three weeks old. And during this time of year, it's so much fun. I look out the uh, water dishes just outside the window next to my computer, so I don't get a lot done. I'm watching the quail and other birds all the time. Notice the uh, baby quail on the far left. See that white wing? Well, that's called leucistic, or leucistic is sometimes pronounced. And it's not an albino, of course, but just a white patch where there's no color. And that chick was hung around for a number of weeks and I was hoping it would turn into an adult and no, then I never saw it again. But again, there are a lot of predators out there for both the adults and the chicks. There are coyotes and there are foxes. Of course, foxes are pretty much nocturnal. Um, and there are bobcats and hawks. So there are a lot of predators. So we may start out with uh, 12 chicks and then it kind of goes down to 10 and nine and eight. And you think, oh, that's too bad. Well. We need to kind of weed it out, otherwise we'd be up to our elbows and baby quail, I think. This one I call Hop on Pop. You can see the rocks in the dish. Look how their little tails have developed. dad and family. <laughs> and they're growing up. Now these kids are probably about six weeks old or so. You cannot tell boys from girls yet, but they're growing. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, this reminds me of a, a family outing, a family picnic with aunts and uncles and cousins all gathered around. and summer arrives. The quail are growing, now we can tell the boys from the girls. So these kids are approximately eight weeks old. Mom and dad are in the middle and take a look on either side are two young ones, one female and one male. You can see the, the pattern of, uh, of the males now kind of blotchy because it's just coming in. I love the way their little feet are lined up. Dust baths, mention that briefly. Many birds and mammals do dust baths. Now you might wonder, how can you get clean if you're throwing dirt on yourself? But what happens is that there's an uh, oil secreted right against the skin. And this excess oil has to be gotten rid of. And, and in that oil are probably little critters living as well. And so they will bathe in the, in the dirt. And the quail have become masters at this. Now I've seen roadrunners do it, finches and a variety of other birds, but boy, quail are good. And as are bunnies and squirrels. So every afternoon, the quail would come in my front yard and do this, scratch around, throw it down on the And you see another one doing it in the far, far left. And this is about getting rid of that oil. And doing it day after day in the same spot, those depressions become quite deep. <laughs> you can sometimes barely see the quail as it's deep down in the little hole that's made. I have never seen quail take a, a water bath ever. So this is what they do. Sometimes they kick dirt on each other.
and the monsoon storms arrive. Now, in the thick of the storm, you don't see anybody. The, all the birds have just disappeared. Mammals aren't to be seen anywhere. All undercover somewhere. But the minute the rain lets up, out they come, looking a bit bedraggled. I love the female in the lower right corner. Have you ever seen a quail that looked more upset, distressed, unhappy? And interesting thing happened, I had a house guest and she went out to my front yard one morning just to kind of look around. Luckily, she had her phone with her. And on her bucket list had always been a sight of a really, a real wild Gila monster. And there it was. Now you may be wondering, why am I doing a Gila monster video? Well, check out the quail. Here they come, they're young ones. Uh, they uh, know this guy is probably not a good one to have around, so they're not exactly chasing it, but they're making sure it leaves the yard. Ah, good, all gone. Another time, this is my trail camera. Listen to the quail in the background. Apparently, Bobcat is not hungry. Here come the quail. They've been watching him. Now they get quite brave. They run around the side of the house to make sure he's gone. Fall arrives. Now we don't see chicks anymore. They've all grown up. You can't tell the chicks from the adults. So as they come to the water dish, we don't see any, any young ones. And I included this for uh, one reason. Is uh, notice the, what, the uh, morning dove, how differently it drinks. It's, mm, it's it sticks its bill in the water and it just slurps it up where the other birds will uh, pick it up in their lower mandible. Oops, something, <laughs> stop that video, I don't know why. Okay, winter arrives. Now the quail, the babies are all back in the flock, they're adults and they join the flock again. And some mornings we have uh, quite cool, not often in Tucson, but a few times, uh, I, maybe once every couple of years, it gets cold enough for the water dish to freeze. And the quail will walk across it looking a little perplexed. And a new year is about to begin, and the cycle of life continues. Chicks are born, or I'm sorry, hatched. <laughs> they grow up, and they, again, they become part of the flock. I hope you enjoyed learning about our lives and adventures throughout the year. Thanks for coming, everybody. Cheep, 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 cheep. And that is my program.
That was great, Doris. Oh, thank you. Perfect for spring. Very perfect for spring. Yep, it is. Uh, so we need you now to um, turn off your, your share. Okay. Stop, screen, stop screen share. We'll do that. And um, if there's people in the audience who want to ask a question or, um, or be seen, of course, you can unmute and stop your video. And we'll try to see if this doesn't get too crazy. And then we'll go through all the chats. There were a number of people who uh, put chats on. I see. But um, is there somebody who'd like to just speak at this point? That was wonderful, Doris. Oh, thank you. Linda Gregory has um, led many of our bird field trips and she's a, a bird photographer herself. And I'm not sure if I mentioned that all of these videos were taken either in my yard or my neighbor's yard and maybe around the neighborhood. Yeah, that's my favorite place to photograph birds actually is in my backyard. Yes. <laughs> And one of the chats was, um, I, I get a lot of quail in my backyard, and my poor dog was going bananas trying to look for the quail around my computer. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I just have one comment. I think that my uh, grandkids would really enjoy this video. I, I think, uh, it seems like my wife said that, that Phil was... Uh, recording this so that'd be great if i could get a link uh, uh just what go to the camera club website or something now go to youtube phil and look up um gvr camera club on oh. youtube okay super cool. thank you yeah great great presentation Appreciate yes, it was you. wonderful oh thank you thank you I'm, I'm going to give you some of the chat questions. You probably could see those too if you hit your chat button, but um, where did you get the Quail Sisters song? Oh, yeah. I'll tell you about that. Um, my husband and I do, we did a lot of traveling and a lot of, with Road Scholar. And we, we were up in Sedona back some years, not too many years ago, taking a class in watercolor. And Road Scholar is great about uh, doing, always having activities going. So one evening, we uh, were invited to the, they, had, they brought in this couple, and they sang their Western songs. And this was one of their songs. There's more to it. goes on about a coyote and so on. And I just love that song. And they were selling their CDs. And so I bought the CD. Ah. And uh, as I was putting this together, I thought, oh, I've got to find, got to do that song. So I got into my CD cupboard, and thank goodness I found it. And on it was a website. So I got on it and I emailed and I found the fellow who sang the song. I got, got him. So I wrote to him and I explained what I wanted to do with it. And did I have, could I get permission? And he said, oh, go ahead. He said, we were at a Western songwriters conference one day and we all got together and just sort of came up with a song as a group project. He said, it doesn't, no one owns it, it's all yours. Nice. <laughs> right. so I feel good. But I didn't want to play it if it was copyrighted. So I was happy. Yeah, very it. smart way to get a song, I have to say. <laughs> um, here's one. Do the white spines and the mother quail's feathers have a special name? Yeah. Uh, what appeared to be spines, you know, were in quite a few of your shots. Okay, around the neck? Around the neck area? No, near the wing. Oh, oh, that's, I don't think those are spines, those are feathers, but I'm sure ornithologists have word for every feather. I don't know what it is. So. Okay. We have quite a number of, this was fantastic, excellent program. This was a wonderful presentation. Thanks, very educational, loved it. Um, I just saw these birds this morning scurry out from under a car and then later two, two scared me as they suddenly flew out of a bush that I walked by. Ah, uh, maybe I um, <laughs> What is the make and model price of your camera? And I also wanted to hear more about what you call the cube camera. Okay, um, the GoPro, you know, they make a variety of cameras. And I've got one of the less expensive ones. I can't tell you what, what it cost. It wasn't a lot, maybe a hundred and something. The little Polaroid. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Linda, is that you? <laughs> uh, um, a little Polaroid cube camera I discovered about five years ago. I was on Facebook and you know how ads pop up. 
And I mm-hmm. saw that and I thought, well, that looks interesting. And uh, I thought, well, I'll order one. They were cheap. They were about 50 bucks. So I ordered the one, not really expecting much. You saw the size. It just fits in the palm of your hand. So I charged it and put it outside. And it takes that little uh, chip from the, um, oh, the camera uh, card, the small chip. I can't remember. The SD card? Or chip or something like that. And Mm -hmm. I stuck the camera outside near the water dish, not really expecting much of anything. Brought it in, plugged it into my computer, and I was blown away with the quality of both the sound and the um, the video. Yeah. And really. So I ended up buying about four or five of those just so I could have put them all over the place and then the cube. Now I'm not sure. I, I meant to look before this morning. Uh, I don't know if they're still making them. The pol- anyway, the original Polaroid company I think is gone, but there these are called Polaroid cube cameras. So you can Google it and see if they're still around. Okay, thank you. Uh, Here's a question. Do quail families adopt other chicks? Ah, good question. Now, when these eggs were there, another female must have been by, but mom had no idea. I don't think they can count. But I have seen and I have heard that they don't. And I can't say it all the time, but that they're not real good about uh, picking up an abandoned chick or a lost chick. Okay. Um, egg hatching scenes and baby quail are amazing. So such a wonderful sign of spring. Mm-hmm. Do they breed within their own flock or outsiders introduced at some point? Oh boy, you know, I, I can't answer that. And I don't know how many studies have been done. And when you see that whole flock, how do they know who's been <laughs> and whom? I, I do not know the answer to that. I wish I did. Okay, Uh, lovely instructive video, thanks. So, uh, does anybody else have a comment or a question? I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I thought that everything, you were so knowledgeable, the pictures were wonderful, just a great, great job. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, you know, when you do something like this, you really learn a lot. And uh, so I was you know, doing as much research as I could with the ornithology uh, lab of Cornell and so on, anything I could find, but I couldn't find the answers to everything. Yeah, that <laughs> Cornell um, ornithology service is terrific. It is. Yeah, I, I found some feathers I thought looked like they had blood in them, waxy looking blood. And I uh, took a picture and I sent it on, um, emailed it to Cornell Labs. Yeah. And they told me it was from a cedar wax wing. Oh. It wasn't blood at all. It's mm. really interesting. Huh. Yeah, they're great. Uh, thank you out to uh, Phil Rock for doing the background uh, support. I appreciate yeah. it. So do yes, I. that will put it. He did put it on YouTube for everyone and recorded it. So again, if you go to GVR Camera Club on YouTube, you'll be able to see uh, Doris's program and and several others. I have my hand up. Well, thank you, Doris. We really appreciate you coming in, and and you're a wonderful photographer and a great presenter. Well, thank you. Was, was Are you there, <laughs> Doris? What to do? I think we're ending. Whether. We- Phil, are you there? Oh, there she is. Doris? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, thanks very much. And it was a wonderful program. You did a wonderful job. Oh, thank you so much. I'm sure we've got a lot of camera club members that are going to be out there trying to get some footage of those quail this spring. Yep. Fun to do. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Bye, everybody. Hope you tune in uh, in April, April 15th for our last speaker series. You can check on Wild Apricot to see just what that's going to be. Thanks, Holly. Appreciate it. Okay, bye. Thanks, Phil and Jean. And definitely Doris. (laughs) Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.